Oh, there you heard it from the boss. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit today before we get going uh, on Boccaccio, uh, on the Decameron, because I know Evelyn and, and uh, Alyssa and Lean and, and Hattie are dying to talk about their weird little stories. But before we do that, we're going to talk a little more about Dante, about Dante's Divine Comedy. So let's see. Okay, Matt, you've read Divine Comedy. And Chuck, you've read Divine Comedy. Dick, have you ever read it? No. Really? I did in college, but oh, that was yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. a million years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah, you you were good pals with Dante. You went out for coffee from time to time. Yeah, right, <laughs> okay. right. So, first of all, um, it's a it's it's like so important a book, in spite of the fact of of the levels of hell um, and 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 its title, which is totally misleading. Um, and that was not his title, by the way. Um, and that that goes uh, uh, just a whole bunch of issues with that. I, I just wanted to to if if you're a bit of a linguist, you just just pick up Dante at any point in time and just read a little bit of it. And it, it really is kind of fun. By the way, we have an eight and a half hour flight over to Germany. Um, pick up a cheap version, a cheap thing of Dante's Divine Comedy, and you can read it on the plane. Maybe you fall asleep. I don't know. Okay, so it's first of all, it's not a comedy. In in older literature, it's called a commedia, and a commedia. Well, so it's mistranslated to comedy, but it doesn't mean comedy. A commedia is the other form of literature. There are only two forms of lit. lit. Well, you can you can summarize it. One is a tragedy, mm -hmm. and that's you start off. Wherever you start off, normally in a nice spot, and then it, everything goes south, and that's the end of the story. So think of Antigone or, or Sophocles or or any any of any of your Greek writers, really. Um, but a commedia only means it ends up okay. You know, it's sort of like a happy ever happy uh, uh, ever after story where you start off wherever you start off and things happen and it's not bad. And you know that's kind of fun when you have a story that that uh, that doesn't end in in awful things. Why it's kind of um, divine, isn't it? And that's where the that's how the uh, uh, his also called the Inferno, uh, how it got called the Divine Comedy. So it's not a comedy comedy. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two is that it's such an important book because, Evelyn, how's this for a question? What language is it written in? Evelyn, you want to take a guess? Um... I'm, I don't think it's Italian, but. Yeah. I love, I love the fact that you knew it wasn't, because if it was, why the hell would I ask it, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, first of all, it's not Latin. And it's not Italian yet. It's written in a kind of a, a, a discursive form of Latin that was spoken and written in Tuscany. That's the section that, that we're going to be going to and living in. And so it was, you, some, some uh, linguists call it Tuscan, um, but it, it, it was a dialect of Latin and it became Italian. If there was not for Dante's book, we wouldn't have Italian the way we have it now. It was that famous. People read it outside of Tuscany and all, and they started speaking and using the lingo and the organization that Dante did. So Dante took Latin, um, uh, took what he was familiar with, and uh, a kind of a vulgate, uh, kind of a kind of a common language, and moved it forward. So that's why that's so important, among other things. Oh, and then there's the content of the damn book. So there's that. Okay, so Boccaccio, Decameron. Evelyn, you want to give us, uh, uh, you were doing day one, were you? Yes. Okay. I read the, I read day one, the first story and sixth story. 
Okay. Give us a rundown on the on the first story. The first story um has a bunch of names I can't pronounce. Yeah. Uh, but they're all there is... they're all travelers with Boccaccio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And the first story talks about um a guy who did terrible things throughout his life, duped a priest into like absolving him, and then once he died, those lies led to him becoming a saint in their town. Because like he had done a bunch of terrible things. Um like you name it, done it, and then a guy he owed a favor asked him to come to his town and do some business for him. And he did. And while he was there, he got ill. And the people he the people whose house he was living with was like, people will be upset if this guy dies at our house. Um, um, and he won't be allowed to be buried if in the church if he hasn't been absolved of any of his sins. Um, and hearing this he had um the guy had them go get like the holiest friar at like the local monastery and they brought the friar and he lies about everything he's ever done to make him seem like the holiest person mm -hmm. um, and what happens um the guy absolves him and then when he dies he um the friar has his funeral and he does this great speech about the holiness, this guy's holiness, and he's forever known as a saint there. That's it. Good. So the first story is a one-off punch against the church. <laughs> good. Gee, I wonder where Martin Luther got his ideas. Yeah, okay, good. And the next story, please. Um, that was the sixth story. Um it was shorter, but it was still interesting. Um, it talked about a like a like head of a ch head of church. He was like really really greedy, mm -hmm. and um, he heard a rich man um, talking to his buddies go that his wine was so good, even Jesus would have liked it. And so knowing that the guy was really rich, he like basically sued him and made him give a bunch of money to the church. And in order to get out of like a bunch of penances, he gave a lot of money to the church. So he only had to like go to mass and like pray daily and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so, and uh, yeah. um he, the guy was like walking past one mass and he heard them talking about how whatever you give um you will receive a hundredfold in heaven and he um saw the guy who um the guy who like caught him talking bad about Jesus I guess is what mm -hmm. he'd done um, and he caught the guy with a bunch of like his peers, his like fellow fellow friars, and he says, "I'm I'm worried about you." And the guy's like, "Why?" And he's like, "Well, I keep seeing that you serve this um, vegetable broth to all the poor people, and you give so much of this terrible vegetable broth broth to the poor people." That when you go to heaven, you're going to be drowning in it. <laughs> and um, he basically humiliated the guy in front of all of his peers. And they all laughed at him. And he got enraged and told him, just go do whatever you want. Just don't be in my face ever again. Mm -hmm. uh, both stories about sticking it to the man, the power thing. And also... also um, a lot of these stories make fun of the church. And why? Because it's a pandemic. And they've all left Florence. 
And of course, whether you want to say it out loud or not, the perception is, you know, you wouldn't have this pandemic if God really looked after us. God isn't. God's representatives are the ones at fault, etc. So, um, by the way, <laughs> this goes for COVID as well as back in the 14th century. So, good. Excellent. Alyssa, you want to give us a quick rundown? Okay. I'll try my best. So, um... I had day three, and the uh, the first story that I picked is the first the first story. So um, it's called um, Masi Masito of Lapercio uh, <laughs> findeth himself dumb and becometh gardener to a convent of women who all flock to lie with him. So basically, <laughs> yeah, we're we're in, we're into our sex phase here. Yes. Yeah, I was like, well, we're just getting into it. So, okay. So, I was like, uh, so summary, um, kind of like the beginning paragraph, it was like, women who become nuns, like, change their personality personality to stone, so they get rid of their appetites or desires. Um, so, there's this not, not to guy uh, who feels neglected and um, this Masito who is dumb and, you know, basically mute or what the other people would call dumb and stuff. Um, uh, and, and he told, and he told Massimo, he told Massimo about Masito about um, uh, the woman here and just, you know, and, the abbess was fine with him here and he was this mas, mas, masito man he was um you know um you know just think of your you know he was very superstar like you know he had he had all the goods and everything he was quite good to look at and the abbess was fine with him helping with the garden and stuff so uh some of uh the nuns catch of catch a glimpse of his nature and um they're memorized by it and they all like flock towards him and realize and just succumb to their appetites and um they were actually caught, you know, the, these nuns were caught with uh, the guy and they're confronted towards the abbess, but the abbess doesn't believe it. Um, so they just kind of, she, so she kind of lets it go. And then he, she sees him and what he has to offer and catches a glimpse of what he has. And uh, she is just succumbed to her appetite so now he is basically sleeping with nine women and mm -hmm. at this point in time when he realizes this he goes to the abbess and he suddenly has the power to speak and she's like well, i thought you were mute and he's like yeah i was but god is like giving me this power to like tell you no like to tell me like to stop because i can't take sleeping with nine women and um so, but she says no, and basically, like, tell them, like, no, you have to, like, su su suffice all our needs. So, anyways, um, but all of it is consensually. Um, and, uh, but then he becomes a bailiff um, because the bailiff dies. And then once the abbess dies, he is free. Uh, and then the next story is... Um, yeah, basically, the, it's the third story. I did the third story. So it's I'm just going to go into it. So uh, it's called Under Colors of Confusion, Confusing, of Confusion and Exceeding Niceness of um, uh, uh, Consequence, a Lady Being, like, Captured by, uh, not captured, but, like, liking this young man uh bringeth a grave friar without his misdoubting him there to afford the means of giving entire effect of to her plea so basically the town is full of trickery and there's this woman who's beautiful she's married to um a man but he isn't very rich um and, but she knows she's worth more. So she goes to the friar and she's basically created these three scenarios asking for his advice. So the first one says, the first one was, um, 
says her husband is rich, but he's not giving her the love she deserves. So the friar tells her to leave him. Um, the second one is there's a man who's passing at the house and like just kind of looking at her and like kind of being stalkerish. And the man, uh, and then the friar says, I know who he is. I'll go talk to him. Talks to him isn't the right guy. So then she keeps coming back. And then the third one is like, so the third one is like, so this apparently this random guy um, climbed up the tree of her house, of her house, and um, went came in through the roof and basically saw her naked. And, um, and so the friar's like, you know what? I'll go check it out. It's fine. Basically climbs up the tree, does the thing. And then so they saw, she, they, yeah, he saw her naked and they just, you know, had a great time together. So, yeah. Yeah, good. Good. So, so we, we have uh, the third day is written by a high school male. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in other words, it's just like the sitcoms of today. Um, yeah. Uh, excellent, excellent. You too. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna stop it there. Lean and Hattie, I want you two to go next week, and I, if you could try to summarize it um, a little less of how the watch is made, and just in terms of the summary, <laughs> which is fine, <laughs> you, you know, so we can get on. But th thank you very much. That's great. Is that okay, Lean and Hattie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Well, you read it again. Okay, so we're gonna continue on with slides which I think, yeah, okay, here's Italy again, and uh, oh yeah, that's where we live and all. And you remember last time we looked at the Palazzo Vecchio, the old palace, um, which we will see, we'll walk right by it every day, every time we leave. And we'll, we, we found out last time we learned that one of the things we do is we see public art, you know, and, and public art anymore simply doesn't exist. Um, you know, public art is like, uh, is, is some general on a horse and the only one that appreciates it in a public park and only one that appreciates him anymore in the United States is the bird that poops on his head, you know? That's public art. Whereas all this is public art and it's made there to, to help us deal with our good fortune and to continue believing that we really are God's chosen people here uh, in Florence, where the Renaissance begins. And then we saw uh, the cathedral last time, uh, Brunelleschi's cathedral the facade, the uh, on the left, the baptistry, and that beautiful uh, dome, that lantern up there. And, um, um, and we noted, among other things, that the actual design is not Renaissance. And I made reference to this, that the notion of how the dome was built was a Renaissance way, even though the dome is pointed, so therefore it isn't really a Renaissance. Um, and I think we saw uh, both, both crucifixes by Berlinguero, Berlingeri, and Copo de Marcovaldo, and we noted the gold and the formality there, and that's kind of where we ended. And that's Gothic. That's pre- Renaissance. So that's Duegento, the 1200s, and we're just getting sort of into the 1300s. Now this stuff is new tonight, and you will see all this stuff. The first one I'm going to show you is the Maesta. And I mean, you can call these things a number of things. Don't forget, artists are not signing their works. There's no reason to sign your work. First of all, it's inappropriate. They're all religious works. You're not putting your name next to God, are you? So you wouldn't sign it. Uh, and then um, uh, everyone would know your style and everyone would know, oh, in this, in this church, we had the, the way you pronounce this art is Chimabui. We had Chimabui do it. The, ma ma the Maya style means, means, um, uh, the enthroned Madonna. So that's what you see here. And I can throw hundreds of these things at you, but you'll see this one. And it's a, a particularly interesting one. It's the late Duegento. So it's a late Gothic period and it's the Virgin holding the Christ child, yes. Um, it's not done from nature, uh, as you could probably tell. Um, you know, the, the strange distortion of the Virgin or the, the you can tell the, the cloak, 
the way the light reflects off the blue robes, those little gold marks, that isn't the way light looks on cloth. And, um, and, and then there's Jesus, you know, who's like a little midget. Um, you're just a little man <laughs> uh, because you don't do children. You're not going to have a child pose for you. So, uh, and Jesus is doing the Boy Scout salute there. You, you might notice there, right? Okay. Um, that's, that's his sign, his gesture for teaching. And the Virgin is introduced here. I'd like you to see my son, Jesus. And it's the enthroned Madonna. So this is in heaven. And, and therefore, it's this heavenly throne. What's so interesting here is uh, it is not like the Berlinguero or the Copo de Marcovaldo because it is so, uh, and and we, we have people writing during the time, it's so realistic. They can't believe how realistic it is. You look at that and say, what the hell are they talking about? You you have these saints on on the, the these angels on the left and the right. And, you know, everybody's got these these monstrous gold halos and their heads are tilted one way or the other just to help the movement go on up. There's this very uncomfortable throne thing going on there. And then you see the four guys underneath. But it was so realistic. Okay. It's everything's gold. Why is it gold? It's not gold outside. It's blue sky, white sky if it's snowing or whatever, clouds. Oh, but it's gold. Why? It's heaven. Everybody knows heaven, heaven stars, and, and heaven is all gold. Okay, fine. We'll leave it. We'll leave it there. What about the use of space? This is the first time we've seen a work that uses space. Does she sit realistically in that chair? By the way, um, Coming out kind of of her butt on the left and the right is a dark red. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse when I do this? Yes. Okay. Oh, good. So right here and right over here, this is actually uh, um, uh, a little cover, uh, a little cushion for her seat. So she's supposed to be sitting on that because, I mean, a stone throne would be kind of uh, uncomfortable. Uh, so... It's, it's, it's not entirely realistic use of space. Although if you see where I am now, you see this step is in front of this step, which is in front of this step, which is in front. So there is a, kind of a foreground middle ground going on until you get to the guys down at the bottom. Okay. So does anyone want to guess who those four people da are? down there. Oh, and Professor Schlimm is not allowed to guess. Uh, and this is how big it is. You're going to see this. It's in the Uffizi. We're going to see it. Is it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, it could be. It but isn't. it isn't. <laughs> but it could be. That's a great guess. Okay, so here's the shortcut. I think I got, yeah, I got a detail of these boys down here. Right. OK, um, whenever you see old guys with beards, usually frowning, uh, never really happy, but they have scrolls, in other words, books of some sort, but scrolls, scrolls, beards and scrolls, those are Old Testament prophets. So it's seen as as being the the Hebrew Testament is the basis for the New Testament, you see. But. Uh, I like your Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John thing. Uh, that, that uh, they'd they'd probably be too young. They were basically teenagers when they were apostles. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, the most interesting part of this, uh, I'll back up for a second, is where are they in terms of this heavenly throne? I talked about a naturalistic space on the stairs, and maybe she's sitting down there. And we see things that are in front of other things simply through overlap. But look down below. Do you see how uncomfortable it is? This looks like an arch, doesn't it? A simple flat yeah. arch, and he's underneath it. And these two are under an arch, too. Wait a minute. That's not an arch. That's actually going back in depth. It's curving around. 
and and then the one on the right is that way too. Do you see? So this is at once an arch and at once going back in depth. In other words, it's not entirely clear. In other words, the amount of naturalism that we see here is really rather limited. But you can tell Chimabui is trying to do stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, next to this picture is another one um, by his student, Giotto. Um, and you know, with Giotto, we break into the Trecento, the 1300s. Now, you might have wondered how naturalistic the Chimabui was, but when you look at this, well, this enthroned, oh, by the way, Ognesanti is an Italian word, and it, it's, uh, it means uh, all saints. Um, actually, you all know what Ognesanti means, because you celebrate it every Halloween. That's All Saints Day. The reason you have Halloween is because all this, all everyone who has lived or died comes back again. All the saints come back again. And that's supposed to be a little bit spooky. I'm doing a shortcut on this. But Agnesanti just means all saints. So on November 1st in Italy is Agnesanti, is, is All Saints Day. It's, the evening before is Halloween too. Okay, anyhow. Um, so it's, it's another enthroned virgin. So here's a virgin with a Christ child once again. Um, you know, there he is doing his teaching thing. Once again, he looks like a little, you know, looks like a puppet, doesn't he? He looks, uh, you know, a ventriloquist pu puppet. But now, look at how solid they look. They almost look sculptural, don't they? And, the, and these, these angels down below, you see where it's light and it goes to dark. They look so round. And the faces look how much more naturalistic. And in perspective, this little throne seems to be as we walk up these stairs, etc. But we still have everything's gold. And all the halos are flat. Got to have flat halos. You see with Giotto, we're moving quickly towards more naturalism even though all of his people look all the same. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, this, this will confuse you. You're going to see all these three in the Uffizi. Um, I don't think they fit in one room. I think the two are in one room and one's in the other. Maybe they're all three. Um, the one on the left, which is the Chimabui, they're virtually all the same size. They're about 11, 12 feet high. Um, and, of course, they were made for churches. Uh, um, the, the throne Madonna by Chimabui on the left, in the middle is Giotto, and on the right is Duccio, and I'm not even going to go into, into that one, um, but but we'll see them all, and we'll see, you can just imagine the effect in a church, how the light would reflect on this gold. Uh, by the way, it, it's, it's not on canvas, things aren't done on canvas yet, it's all on wood, and so therefore jewelers would have been involved in making of this. And uh, we can, because it's well lit, we can go up close to it uh, and, and see it. That'll be marvelous. Um, almost all of these would have had um, other panel pictures next to them. And, Mostly, they haven't survived. And the ones that have are never in the same museum. So, for instance, this one, this, this by Giotto, these angels down here, actually the rest of their legs are in a panel over here and over here. But it's not in the Uffizi. It's in Germany. So, And no one will put all the stuff together. It'd be great to see them all together. I mean, you can cut them out. But no one would loan the works to put them all together because everyone's scared. You're going to keep mine, aren't you? You know, so everyone's really happy. Okay. Now, here we are. We're in Florence and the year is uh, 1401. And we have just, through the grace of God, lived through an attack from Siena. Those nasty people in Siena mounted an army. They came down. They were about ready to destroy our town, our, our Florence, take over everything. 
and our mercenaries tried to fight them off. Um, and they did a good job, but they were still going to come down. And you know what happened? Literally, the night before they were going to come down from the hills, the, the hills all around Florence, you'll see. Um, the night before, there was an earthquake. And the general of the Sienese was killed, and a number of the people too. So uh, that that made for easy routing by the uh, uh, by the mercenaries, by the Florentine mercenaries. So Florence is saying, you know, God spared us. God loves us. Okay, we're going to decorate the baptistry doors. We want it. We want new art for the baptistry doors. So the the, the uh, city fathers did a competition, and the competition was this. Here's the subject. It's the Hebrew Testament subject. In, in Hebrew, it's called the Akedah. Um, just interested, Matt. When you teach this, do you call it the Akedah too, or do, um, I don't know if in seminary do they refer to it by the Hebrew name or or just the the sacrifice of Isaac? Um. So I, I see that term a lot in the scholarship, but um, honestly, we don't always have a lot of time to get into the the details. I mean, when I have my my class on Genesis, I'll I'll explain. It's called the Akedah, and you know whether it 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 should be called the sacrifice or the binding of Isaac and all that. Oh, neat! neat. I just didn't know. You know, thanks. Um, in Hebrew, it's referred to as the Akedah, the binding uh, or sacrifice of Isaac. Um, and the story, uh, I'll, I'll give you the short version of the story, um, and it's it's in Genesis, um, in which um, God speaks to Abraham in a dream and says, uh, take Isaac, uh, by the way, Isaac's his son, uh, Abraham, I think, is 80 or so when he has his, his boy, um, and Sarah is no uh, uh, young one either, she's in her 70s. Um, and he finally has a child. Uh, take Isaac, uh, your only one, take him up to the mountain, and um, I'll tell you what to do next, but um, there'll be a sacrifice. So 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 uh, the the Torah, the 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 Old Testament tells you tells us then Abraham goes up with his son and with two servants and um, um, uh, uh, a donkey. Um, and with wood to make a sacrifice, because that's how you sacrifice God in, in this part of the, the Hebrew Testament. And just about at the point, of course, we, we don't know what Isaac is thinking. We don't even know his age. Um, but uh, he says, well, Dad, uh, where's the sacrifice? You said we're going to sacrifice to God. Okay, you hear voices. We're going to sacrifice to God. Um Where's the sacrifice? He binds Isaac up, and at the point of almost killing I almost, the angel of God, very important here, not God, but an angel of God comes in and says, well, this has been a test. It's only a test. Um, let the boy go. And in that thicket over there, find a ram, sacrifice the ram, go back. This was just a test. Have a nice day. That's the short version of it. So here is Isaac, the boy. Here is Abraham. Here is the angel of God coming in and saying, uh, whoa, stop. This was only a test. There's the ram in the thicket. Here is the, um, the donkey. And here are the two servants. Now, all these people are in both images I'm going to show you because they made it to this level. And the city fathers picked one of them. And you'll tell me which one in a minute. Um, if you look at both of these, these boys here, um, what are they doing? I don't know if you can see it in this one. I don't think I can blow it up. But um, he's removing a thorn from his foot, the bottom of his foot. Why? That, by the way, that's not in the story. So why is he doing that? And this one is tying a shoe here doing the equivalent of tying a shoe. So what, what's, what's that about? Well, as a matter of fact, five years before this work was done, in Rome, they excavated a Roman statue of a boy taking a thorn out of his foot. And so here, 
you have this artist, uh, Brunelleschi, demonstrating, hey, I know what Roman art is. I know what classical stuff is. He's showing you how modern he is. So he's, employ he's employing that visual motif. So here is one of the, the stories. Here's the other one. And this one is by Ghiberti. I'm going to move something. Yeah, okay, fine. And uh, there's the father again. And there's the boy. And here's the angel come running in. There's the ram in the thicket. Here are the, the two servants um, uh, and the donkey uh, and the altar right there. This altar, by the way, has this, what's called a strigil pattern on it, a funny, funky pattern, um, uh, which is, can be found in classical tombs. So once again, even Ghiberti saying, see, see, I can do Roman classical crap too. Um, both uh, Abrahams have very naturalistic clothing. It's almost wet drapery-like. Oops. Oops, sorry. There. So City Fathers chose one of these uh, artists to decorate the doors of the baptistry. Which one? This one, the Brunelleschi? Or this one, the Ghiberti? And let me preface, I'm going to ask you, what's your vote? Uh, but let me preface it first with, they're both trying to show how classical they can become, how much like Rome, how much like Greek and Roman art. And they both have bits and pieces. So, I don't know, what do you think? Lean, what do you think? Do you think it was the Brunelleschi or the Ghiberti that won? Uh, was it the Ghiberti? Okay, you know I'm gonna say why. I just like that one more. I'm not actually sure why. <laughs> why do you like it more? Oh, by the way, uh, we don't know. The city fathers just chose it. And so so we can philosophize uh, until the cows come home. We we have no idea, but we, we have ideas. Anyhow, but why do you like this one more? Um, I don't know. I think it looks like like the way it's like made. I think it looks cooler and you could just like see more from it. I don't know. I think see more what like you get more from it i think than the other one like what what do you get oh i agree i agree with you i'm just trying to pull you out here um i don't know uh uh i think like the angel coming down and then like the servants and the mule like just under that like mountain thing or i don't know what that's supposed oh, yeah. to be uh -huh, yeah and yeah. I th so, so you're saying it's more of a grouping and more communication within this group and a communication within this group than the other one that might be separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although you didn't say it, but that's sort of what you're saying. Was like, okay, fine. I, yeah, I get it. Okay. Hattie, which one do you think might have won and why? Sorry, you kind of cut out for the question. What did you say? Oh, yeah, yeah. So which one of these do you think won and why? The Brunelleschi or the Ghiberti? Um, I think uh the first one. Brunelleschi. The one that's not the other one. The one that's not this one. Okay, the other first one. That's called the second one. Okay. okay sorry. <laughs> the the second one. Um, yeah, the Ghiberti. I, I just feel like it just looks way more detailed, and I feel like I don't know. I first, I think that one won. I just think it looks more detailed. I think that's really the reason why. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dick, which one do you think won? Uh, the Berkey. The faces in it. The Berkey? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. And seeing the two young boys and Abraham. There looks like there's more detail. Interesting. That's good. Anyone else want to add anything? And I'll tell I you. think the I think the Gaberti one offers more depth. Um, I don't know. It just it just seems like the other one is um, flat, and this one 
not, yeah, that one just seems kind of flat to me. And the Gaberte one, just it's just more appealing. It just feels like there's a better flow, and I do like the detail that's in that one. So uh, put, write that down somewhere that Dick and I agreed. <laughs> 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 yeah, we, we're recording this, Dick, so uh, you know, that's, that's it. Um, and the point, in fact, is you are all correct. The compared to what well, Brunelleschi was mad as hell, because Brunelleschi thought he had this <clears throat> in, in his pocket. Um, we One of the reasons we think that Brunelleschi did not win is that that this was very much like the paintings we have seen, more a presentation rather than an intense involvement of people. I mean, look at that. Look at the angel rushing in and wrestling with Abraham while he's grabbing the neck of his son, Isaac. I mean, you know, one little slip and whoops. As opposed to the word of God is strong enough. And look at the eye contact between this idealized nude figure, grammar, Greek, and Roman classical, of Isaac and dad. I mean, look at, look at dad here. Abraham looks, uh, looks like a, uh, 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 a philosopher, a Greek philosopher. And the detail of the robe and the way the, the robe uh, rolls in the wind. Don't forget this is all bronze done with lost wax process. Well, um, they both had a chance to work again together. And so you're right. And you're not going to actually see this unless on your free day you go to um, uh, the museum of the dome, um, which has these original ones there. Because at the end of the day, though Ghiberti did the doors, you'll see the doors up. The city fathers changed their mind and they had a different subject matter. Uh, so, um, but it's, it's important to see hey. them. Yes. Uh Okay, so these were the south doors, uh, uh, and then because uh, they're like the gates of paradise that Giberte yeah. did. That like that's different, right? I nope. mean, from these these are the paradiso, the gates of paradise. Yes, these are, but it's not with these subjects. So, um, as a matter of fact, I think I had it right there. There. Yeah, this, this is all Ghiberti's work, and it's not that subject. Not only is it not that subject, do you see how how they're framed? As long as long as you brought brought it up, Matt, you see yeah. how it it's it's a uh, it's not a square; it's a rectangle. Um, but how regular it all is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so the the ones you just showed us, I, like, are are both on the church? No, no. Okay. It was a competition that was open to everybody, and these were the finalists. And notice, the city fathers put them in this, we call it a quatrefoil, this frame, this weird frame, which is a gothic frame. Trying to put something neo -cla something classical in a gothic pointed frame, whereas finally, the ones that are in are in that rectangular square frame. Much more Renaissance-like. So you won't actually see these unless you go to the museum. I'll point it out on your free day. But from that, then the city father said, you know, that was good, but we need to finally fix this dome problem we have. We don't have a dome for our cathedral. So it's open. Let's go. And uh, the city fathers made choices. And the choice was Brunelleschi. And the reason why Brunelleschi was chosen is he went down to Rome and mucked around in the Roman ruins in the forum where we're going to go and saw how the Romans built things. They built huge structures. And he figured out, well, the Romans did it this way. I'm going to do it that way. Um, and so uh, Brunelleschi is the one who's responsible for 
for the dome. Now, the way he did it, I'm not going to spend too much time. Yeah, we're kind of late here. Is so it's everything. It's not the drum or the glass there, but everything from here on up. The top is like a big cork holding it together. It's it's called a lantern. Um, and no doubt they had light in it at one point in time, but it was all built by Brunelleschi and then he died actually. It wasn't really finished till, till uh, he, he died, but most of it was done during his life. And we can walk up the stairs, the same stairs that he did, that, that he and his workers used for that. And I don't know if you can see, but you can see people up here. Hmm. And uh, one time, some yob put a mailbox up there as a joke. See, because the Italian mails are notorious for being like slow and they never deliver. So he put a mailbox up there just, you know, for a joke. You know, I thought that was kind of cute. Um, okay, so how did he do it? He did it, this, I did this for students. Uh, it's a computer generated one. Uh, I showed them one time. He constructed it via herringbone construction. So what he did, is he had his workers build here. Maybe you can see it on this level. The next level up out of stone, just to go in a little bit. And then next one horizontally. So you go all around that circle and then it holds it together. Then you go up again, only in a little more all around together. You keep doing that over and over and over and over, but you've got to have the main weight thrust, not where the glass windows are, but on the edges. And that's how he did it. And and it works. And you can climb up there all 463 stairs to the very top. Maybe not you, Dick. Sorry. No, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's a great view, and but you, you can go up. Um and Chuck and I have gone up. Yeah, yeah. Um Okay, and then a few days later, I'm gonna zoom around a little faster here. We're going to go to Pisa, um, that famous uh, tower of Pisa. Now, the leaning tower of Pisa leans because it was built on a crappy piece of land. Um, it was a swamp and it wasn't drained properly. And when it was built, even when it was being built, it started leaning. Currently, it leans, uh, at about five degrees, which is huge. It's kind of a miracle. The whole place is called the, the, the Piazza de uh, the Square of the Miracles. There's a cathedral there and a baptistry too. Um, and it actually leans 15 feet, five degrees. So what they've done, I'm not going to go into detail now. Maybe we'll do it when we're there. What they've done, <laughs> it was real Italian. It was beautiful. So they noticed, for instance, right here, oh, where am I? Yeah, right here, that this was leaning down there. So what they decided to do was dig over here on this side to see if it would go down a little. And as they were digging there, um, the dirt and water shifted, and then it it leaned too much that way. Then they had to dig over this way again, and that didn't seem to work. And then at one point they put concrete in there, and that didn't work because it's based on water. It's muck underneath. Um, the the tower itself is not Renaissance. It's um, but we're going to see it nonetheless. It is Gothic. It's Romanesque. Romanesque refers to um, uh, medieval uh, buildings that were built in, in a particular style. And you see the arch here. You see all those little arches and they're Roman columns, but the arches are curved. They're not pointed, are they? They're curved. Therefore, it's Romanesque. So it dates from about 1250 to 1280. And you can climb up there to the very top, all 296 stairs. Now, it's fewer stairs to me, it's more treacherous because you're going around in a circle, around and around and around up there. Um, and down here below, you can just barely see right down there, um, there are guards you know, with machine guns and you've got to pass through a metal detector to make sure you, you know, you're know you not a terrorist or bringing anything up or 
Uh, I had a student one time who brought a University of Iowa flag and he wanted to drape it so his pal would take a picture of it. They stopped him from doing that, obviously. But it's kind of neat. Once again, everyone doesn't have to go up. I'll figure out how many people want to because they got to buy times for it. Um, you see this uh, ochre colored building in the back. Very important building. That's where the bathrooms are. Anyhow, and on the other side is a church. And we'll go into the church too. Um, oh, geez, we're running. Okay, we're going to go to Santa Maria Novella. Uh, that's St. Mary New. I know it doesn't sound very sexy, but maybe it sounds better in Italian. Santa Maria Novella. Because, I mean, if, if you call the church Santa Maria, I mean, there are like billions of them all around Florence. But this is Santa Maria, the new church. And it's right by the train station. And on a wall is this fresco. A fresco is a painting done on wet plaster. The reason you do it on wet plaster, which is called the bon fresco, good fresco, as opposed to dry plaster, which is fresco seco, dry, is because the, the last layer of plaster is, is almost see-through. And as you put pigments on it, there's a drawing underneath, and you put pigments on it, the plaster kind of acts as a glue and it seals it. So the stuff doesn't uh, flake off. It's pretty neat. And it's very time consumptive. Nobody does those frescoes anymore. So here's Masaccio, 1425. Um, you know, the first sculpture you saw was Ghiberti's. The first building is Brunelleschi's. The first Renaissance, uh, these Renaissance structures, the first Renaissance painting you're looking at. What makes this Renaissance? Well, remember our, our basic definition of, of the Italian Renaissance, a revival of the classical past? Well, I don't know. Do you see columns like Greek and Roman columns? Yep. Do you see the capitals on these columns? See these little curvy guys? Those are called Ionic capitals. Do you see the pilasters over here? Do you see, do any of you really think this breaks in the wall. There's actually uh, 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 an apse or something back there. It's fooling the eye, isn't it? And that's the key to the Renaissance. There's a new interest in naturalism, partly because of the wars in, in Florence, also because they want to differentiate themselves from all the gold background and all the formal religious. This is religion brought to the people. Now, this is almost literally brought to the people because there you have the Trinity, that's God the Father, the Son. The Holy Ghost looks like a tie, but when you get up close, it's not a tie. That, that's a bird. Uh, so that's the Holy Ghost. And there's the Virgin on the left and St. John on the right. But you see down below on the left and the right, they have uh, uh, the donors. Oh. First time we get real people involved here. Now, you got to understand something. Uh, maybe you haven't gotten this yet about religion. Um, it seems to me like in all religions, the more money you have, the closer you are to God. And they certainly believe that then. And so, <laughs> well, they commissioned it. So here is here are the two donors. They're not actually doing what we call in Italian a sacra conversazione. They're not doing a sacred conversation. They're still one step away. They're damn well closer than you and me. But look at how realistic this space is. You know, we looked, we looked at, at the four uh, writers of the Hebrew Testament underneath um, the, the Chimabui. Uh, we didn't know about the space and felt uncomfortable. You don't feel uncomfortable about this space. In fact, if you draw lines all the way through in a book on a picture, so don't do it on my books or anything, you'll find everything comes together right here. And in fact, if you did the heads of these two people, so that, mm. that we're getting close to what's later referred to as one point perspective, a mathematical way to show space. That's what we have here. Let me show detail. And we got this stuff down here. Two Corinthian columns with, uh, with a sarcophagus and a skeleton and Latin above it. There. Let's get closer. Oops. No. Okay. There. So 
I hope that doesn't look like like his tie or his shirt. That's that's the dove. And there's Christ dead on a cross. This is not he's not wobbling like Copo de Marco Valdo. And he's not sitting there open eyed staring out at you like Berlinguero. It's a dead person. And the cloth looks notice the muscles look real. The cloth looks real. And there's God, the father staring out at us, holding up the cross. Notice the halos. They're in perspective. So with the Renaissance, we have a new sense of naturalism. You call it realism, I suppose, but a new sense of naturalism where you can see the space looks natural. And we don't think that the halos are, are ovoids of some sort. We think they're just circles, but in depth. How do you figure that out? Math. Math is not seen as being problematic to religion. Now, down below... Here you've got the skeleton, and it's kind of in disastrous shape, and, and Latin, in abbreviation. It's Latin in abbreviation. And, and uh, given time, I'm sure Matt could figure it all out. But, but that's a nice thing about Latin. You, you can abbreviate little things in it. And it says in Latin, um, as you are, so I once was. As I am, so you are will be Ooh. in other words reminding everyone about the inevitability of death about 20 feet high of fresco this is actually in the cathedral it's of sir john hawkwood doesn't sound very italian does it sir john hawkwood <laughs> that's because um, yeah, he wasn't. He was British. He was the general when the Sienese army was going to go rout the Florentines. But look at look at the date. About 1450. Yep. So the city fathers of Florence said, oh, Sir John Hawkward, you're fabulous. You saved our city. We're going to make a bronze statue the way the Greeks and Romans used to do bronze statues in your honor. And we're going to put it in the Piazza della Signoria. Uh, you know, that's where the Palazzo Vecchio thing is. We're going to do it there. We're going to melt the cannons and we're doing it out of bronze because that was about 1400. And then 1410 came, and then 1420 came, and 1430 came, and somebody said, hey, guys, remember we promised to do something nice for this, this guy, Hawkwood? Oh, who, by the way, is now off. He went back to England. So they say, okay, fine. Hey, Uccello, you know, here's here's a fiver. Do a painting of him, will you? And so this was this was his congratulatory painting. Is it Italian Renaissance? Yes. It's very naturalistic. It's about, as I said, about 20 feet high. It's, and, and it's in prime real estate. It's in the cathedral. It's in, in where the dome is. It's in the side aisle, one of the side aisles. It's huge. Stop and look at it for a second. Okay, there's Sir John Hawkwood. Looks good. That's his trusty horse. It's a painting, of course, um, done in the style of Roman, right? So it's very naturalistic. And the plinth, or all of this, it shows, um, and it says it's in Latin who it is, and 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 the uh, um, uh, uh, the battle that it commemorates, etc. Do you see though in the plinth, we're look we're underneath it, aren't we? Because we can see up right there. We can see up right there. Think of this like a table. You're not looking at the tabletop. You're looking under. Okie doke. I'm going to pause us just for a second. I know we're almost uh, uh, done here. I'm just going to turn this around a little bit. Help my mother to the bathroom. Yeah, well, I told you. Thank you. You didn't have it. Thank you. Okie doke. Thank you very much. When you hear it flush, I'm going to switch it again. Okay. Um, so, but look, look at this. See how naturalistic the, the this it looks like stone. Oh, like carving, and you can see depth, and it's it's just Greek and Roman like. Look at the horse, and look at this John Hawkwood. So, 
when you're looking at the lower section, the base of the statue, it's like you're on the ground, aren't you? And when you look at the horse in Sir John Hopwood, it's like you've just floated 15 feet in the air and you're looking at him straight on. Because if you were on the floor and you looked up at the horse and Sir John Hopwood at that height, all you'd see is his chin or the belly of the horse. So Uccello figured this out and said, okay, if one perspective system is good, how about two? So he applies one system for down here and one system there and puts them together, even though it's not realistic at all. And of course, then he paints these little things, these little symbols, which I'll explain when, when we're there. Um, uh, and he paints them to make it look like sculpture, even though that's all painted. That's Uccello. Um, and I think we're coming, yeah, oh yeah, we're nine now. Um, okay, I, I just want a couple more pictures. This is, uh, in the Fizi, we're gonna see this. It's the first time we've seen a portrait. Uh, we're seeing Battista Sforza on the left. These are two separate paintings you'll see. And as I remember, they're about 18, maybe 20 inches high. And these are good uh, 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 pictures of them. Um, Battista on the left, and the Duke of Milan on the right. And um, obviously very wealthy. Um, the Duke, you, you see all the land there? That's all his land. He's a general and, and, uh, and basically the king of the area, although he goes by Duke and he wears his ducal crown from, from Milan there. Oh, oh, by the way, he looks a little strange because he was in a battle and somebody snipped his nose off um, uh, with a sword. So he always poses from the left because uh, they say on the right it was, and there's his, his wife. By the way, there's nothing wrong with his wife. That's what a really high class lady would look like. Because what she would do is the hair up here, you, you would pluck it out from temple to temple. You'd pluck, ladies would pluck their hairs out and then they would curl their hair over here to make it really tight. It, it, by the way, she does not have eyelids or, or, or hair on the eyelid. Uh, once again, you don't show hair on a woman's face. It was seen as, so, um, and by the way, this is how we know how artists started to learn how to paint portraits. They did a silhouette. You remember when you were in school and, and you posed by a wall and, and you put your head like this and it casts a shadow and somebody traced it. That's exactly how Piero della Francesca painted this. In fact, when I used to teach drawing, then I teach students then how to do portraits real easy this way. Because after you get the general shape of the head and the face, all you got to do is the V for the eye, you know, to see which way the eye goes, the little curvy part of the nose and the mouth. Then you got a portrait. It's real easy. Well, this is Piero della Francesca. Uh, we're we're into the second and third generation, um, and uh, yeah, beautiful work, which we're going to talk about next time because I think we're over nine o'clock now. So I appreciate you coming, and I talk too much. We'll do faster renditions, right, Lean and Hattie, and then uh, and then I'll try not to talk so much next time. To see, we're going to see this Botticelli's, The Birth of Venus which is a naked lady trying to cover herself, not too well, of course. Um, and then we'll see the Primavera right next to it. These two pictures right there in the Uffizi, some good stuff. I think we'll end here. Have a great week. Build a snowman if it snows, what the hell? And I'll <laughs> see you later. Thank you, ciao. Hey. Right. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, thank you all.